Hi guys, my name is Anuj Chindal and today we have rank 3 of RBI 2018. His name is Muhammad Ali. Welcome Muhammad. Thank uh, you. Thanks a lot for coming here. Yeah. So what he's going to do today is uh, we are going to keep it very specific to the requirements of students who are thinking of writing the exam in 2019 or 2020. So what we are going to do is he's going to solely take the entire session and in this session he's going to explain how you can uh, prepare for both phase 1 and phase 2 in a very organized simple and in a very uh, you know easy manner uh, so i'll hand it over to ali without wasting any time all the best ali thank, thank you, you. Yeah. so this is as per my earlier promise in my live session that i'd made that i'd give a strategy for everyone whether it's economics engineering or any other background so this is a basic strategy no coaching required, nothing. This is what I will suggest where you should take coaching, where you shouldn't, or what I did, but also what one can do generally. So we'll quickly get into it. We'll start off with phase one, right? So the RBI grade B phase one, grade B specifically consists of four sections. First section, which is often the most, that's QA, quantitative ability. Second section is reasoning. We've got English. And lastly, and the most important one, GA, General Awareness. So, let's quickly get into it. The first session on its own, first section, uh, Quants has a total of 30 questions on 200. Now, although they may be just 30 questions on 200, the problem comes down to clearing the cutoff. The questions are difficult and sometimes lengthy. And most candidates have a problem with clearing the cutoff. So now if quants is not your forte, then we'll have to understand how do we just score enough to ensure that we always clear the cutoff and then score elsewhere. And then we'll, we'll, we'll get down to how do we study quants in a better fashion. So me personally for RBI grade B 2018, I had used two sources of my own. I did not subscribe to the phase one coaching from Anuj because I was strong with what I thought it would be. So what I use is this. I use a YouTube channel and this goes out to the YouTuber, shout out to him, Study Smart. It's by Chandra Haas because the other channel is named Study Smart as well. And that channel has everything. You can use it for quants, for reasoning, for English. But I personally use it only for quants because Study Smart not only gives you the type of questions, topic wise, ratio proportion, but also what shortcuts can we do. And they also solve questions. So that's very helpful. Additionally, I used CAT material because I have taken CAT before this. So CAT material does help. You could buy CAT material from secondhand sources or photocopies of it, whatever. It's all available in the market. So CAT sources are pretty accurate. So now, so when we're solving QA or when we're studying for quantitative ability and if one just starting off, number one is from whatever study material we have, be it a book like SK Verma, Sarvesh K. Verma for CAT is a very good book. So you will see most books follow a pattern of difficulty. So they've got level of difficulty one, two and three. For RBI or for most examinations, level of difficulty one and two would suffice. They always suffice. So our agenda should be that LOD, level of difficulty one and two, we should hit both the questions in these area. If you're strong with quants, you can move to three, but there's no need for it and such. So now we can divide our mathematics into three areas. Number one, arithmetic, where you've got ratio proportions, percentage, X, Y, Z. Then you've got algebra and geometry. And lastly, permutation, combination, advanced mathematics. So the most scoring area and the area from which most questions come is arithmetic. You have questions on ratio proportion, simple interest, compound interest. You've also got many other areas like percentage, age questions, and all those questions are a major part of arithmetic. So arithmetic, number one, is that you learn all the basics, be it from YouTube, be it from a book. You understand what the ratio is, how do we have ratios, basic formulae for it. And straight away, you get into LOD 1, level of difficulty 1. You don't have to solve these questions in 30 seconds or in like blazing speed, but you have to understand that whatever question you solve from that topic, you get down to it. So a good number of questions would be 50 questions. This is from way back when a, a, a teacher taught me that if you can solve 50 questions of a topic without referring to a teacher or an answer, then you've pretty much got the hang of that topic. So a good number would be 50 questions about how. You, you don't have to go and look at the answer at the back, you've got the answer right. Or you go and ask somebody to solve it. These are 50 questions you solved on your own. That. So that's level of difficulty one. 
Then, once we've got that down, we move on to level, level of difficulty 2. Now, LOD 2 questions. These questions can be slightly lengthier or with a twist which we don't expect. So now what you should do with them? A, practice is key, but after practice, I suggest all candidates maintain a notebook of good questions they come across. Whether it's in a book or on a forum or on a website. And these good questions, you maintain a notebook of good questions. Right. So what these good questions do is number one, see even the examiner has a set number of questions and a set, and a set type of questions he can make. He cannot start building new questions just for an exam because the exam happens every year. So even they are pressed for questions and new questions. Hence we've got an entire array of old questions. So now we must quickly learn to understand and identify patterns in questions and note them down. So if you come across a question which is like, oh, I could not think of a solution this way, or this was new to me, you note that question down and also how to solve it. And then probably spend some time thinking, how could I have solved it quicker, better or that. So that's one important tip. Secondly, calculation speed matters. When you're doing mathematics, it's all about calculation speed. If you're faster than the next person who's calculating, then you will make it through in the examination because RBI 2018, this year the maths was easy, but it, it was with big numbers, big calculations, tedious calculations, and those who could calculate fast were able to make it. So in order to aid your calculation, we should move in this direction. First and foremost, memorize tables to 20. So tables up to 20, T A T A B. tables to 20 into 20. So you should straight away know what is 17 into 14. Like you, you should know this by heart, you, you won't have to spend time calculating this. On top of that, you should know squares up to 32. From one square all the way up to 32 square. This should be memorized. Because this helps in calculation and sometimes approximation and other questions where perfect squares are used. Cubes up to 12. So from one cube all the way up to 12 cubes should suffice. Cubes always help out in compound interest. Where you go compounding for the third year. Right, so cubing is a very helpful thing. Other than that, shortcuts. So now if you're looking for shortcuts, I would suggest that there are many YouTube channels or sources, even, even Anuj hands out shortcuts and stuff like that. You can follow that, but I wouldn't recommend because shortcuts aren't as useful. You will not always have a question tailored for that shortcut. So it's better you learn how to solve it rather than hoping that a shortcut comes by your way. So again, memorizing formulae, a big no-no. Understanding how to use the formulae in a question, fair enough, we can always deal with that. So now, the most important thing for quants is practice. You've heard it since grade one, all the way till the end of your life, you'll also tell your kids that practice, 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 and that's the only way to go about it. Practicing is key. So first we practice without any pressure because we are practicing to solve and to understand and internalize the concepts of that particular topic. Let's say ratio proportion or percentage. Ah, speaking of percentage, we should also know inverse percentages and how to use fractions for percentage. Please add that to your tables, squares and cubes list. You should know, for example, let's say one by two is not only half a fraction, but also 50%. And one by three, 33.3%, 33%. .3%. You should memorize this all the way up to one by 30. Or if not one by 30, then at least one by 20, which is 5%. This will immensely speed, your, speed up your calculation because you will know. For example, if they say in a question that he ate let's say 37.5% of the solution was this. So 37.5% of 800, let's say. So we already know that three by eight, because one by eight is 12.5. So three by eight is going to be 37.5 into 800. So we can quickly multiply it and solve that. It's gonna be 300 ml of whatever solution. So using fractions and percentage to your benefit in inverse order will greatly speed up your calculation. Now coming back to practice. Practice, practice, practice. Agenda number one, 50 questions from that topic so you master it and after that, when it comes to practice, once you've practiced without your, let's say, time pressure, we bring in the time pressure. So first you work on concepts and accuracy and make sure that you can solve it correctly. Doesn't matter what, what amount of time it takes, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes. Then we move towards exam situations. The only way to do this is, if you're very, very bad at quants, you take sectional mocks. But if you're okay with quant, then you could use the mocks for your overall preparation. Now, how does one use a mock for quants? So we take mocks to improve our score in quants. And this is how we should always take our mocks and then analyze the mock score and what to do with it. So when you take a mock, 
let's say if you're very bad at quants and you just want to make sure that you clear the cutoff. So number one, we always look at the difficulty of the paper. If the paper is very, very difficult, let's say for example, RBI 2017, the, the cutoff was 3.5 marks in quants, four questions will do. But let's say RBI 2018, where the quants was fairly easier, it was 7.5 marks. Right. So 7.5 marks. Again, we shouldn't always aim for, okay, one question about that. We should aim out of 30 questions. We should be able to solve a good 10 to 12 questions and if not 15, ideally 50% of the questions so that we are confident when we walk out of the paper that yes, we have cleared the section and this will not hold us back. So we divide it into time phases. So let's say you are allotting yourself. This is pre prior to the mock taking that you are allotting yourself 30 minutes, 30 minutes to your quant section. 30 minutes, 30 questions, and again, you, you are not targeting all 30 questions, therefore it gives you more time per question. So again, so in the first 30 minutes, I want, I what I personally do, and I would advise candidates is that, you spend at least three to four minutes just searching the entire paper. Just go through the entire paper, top to bottom, and look at every question. So that'll give you a rough idea. Yes, I can solve it, I can't solve it. Oh, or is this paper algebra heavy, or is it arithmetics heavy, or is it what? I mean, you understand the type of questions that come by in the paper and then you have a rough idea that how difficult or how easy it is and in these three four minutes use the question palette accurately you mark the question which you think you can solve which yes you read the question be like oh yes i can solve this or i know this so you mark questions so let's say in the first three four minutes out of 30 questions you mark only five questions the, the paper may be difficult but if you mark let's say if you're able to mark 10 or 12 questions that you could easily solve that means the paper is slightly easier and if you mark 20 questions well you, you're pretty much thrown in, in, in any paper so we, we won't be looking at that so okay scenario one let's say if you've only marked five questions that you think you can solve out of 30 in the first three minutes so you straight away get down to solving them if you are able to solve all five questions correctly well and good then you can move on to the other questions so in this way, you move on and on and on. So if you solve five questions and you understand, yes, that even these five questions were difficult, you already have an idea how difficult the paper is, right? So if you solve five questions, you go on, you pick up at least five, ten more in the second round. So in like the first three, four minutes, you have a lot of questions. If you solve five questions in the, let's say, ten minutes. So in the first 14 minutes of a difficult session, you have five correct questions. Then you move on to solving other questions. Again, if you're able to pick up questions, that is how you will slowly, slowly learn to pick up questions. So in an ideal, which is a very difficult paper, 12 questions will do. You already have five which you can solve and then you have to find seven to eight more on the basis of preparation or you might have missed out a question. However, let's say if it's an easy paper and you have 10 to 12 questions which you think you can solve at first go. But then afterwards you realize, okay, out of 10 to 12, you can only solve eight questions. So you understand that this strategy goes back and forth. Once you're done solving these 10 questions or these five questions, again, you take one more round of the paper. Okay, I've solved these, these are left. You read it and then you go for it. Okay, this question will take more time. This question will take less time. This question I have no heads or tail about. Then you know not to do that question. So slowly, slowly you understand this is the test taking, go for it. A good bit of advice is maths. If there's a question in maths, you can always, always, always put in and check the answer. This comes from taking lots and lots of mocks. Once you've taken close to 20, 25 mocks and you've seen lots of questions, there are some questions which are very, very lengthy. But if you punch in the answer from the question itself, from the options, these questions solve themselves because everything checks out. Sometimes there are questions which you just have to leave. There's no point in solving a question like that because it'll eat up valuable time and you can spend that time somewhere else. So this comes up only from only practice enough mocks. So now we have, if you have 30 questions per mock, and you practice let's say 20 of them you've got a total of 600 questions which you've seen taken and seen the answer to out of 600 questions you will always have some questions which you can never solve and you don't have to worry about that because even in the examination you will leave questions but the questions which you should have been able to solve or the areas which you are good at you should always look at them and see whether it was viable at solving because you see given enough time anybody can clear that paper but the time pressure adds on to it so when was the question viable at that time should be your question that if I could solve it and it, it would have only taken me two minutes. Okay. But if it, it would have taken you eight minutes, it was a very good leave. Do not be afraid to leave questions. There is no ego battle here. Your agenda is to only clear an examination and that's it. So do not be afraid to leave leaving questions. Now, post taking your mock, you analyze the score. 
again, if you're taking a, que uh, a mock on quants and reasoning, your accuracy should always be 100%. You attempt 10, you get 10 right. However, not everything is perfect. 100 to 90% is a decent range. Nothing, anything lower than that and you're in trouble because people who aren't good at quants cannot have those many attempts. People who are good at quants can afford to have some accuracy leeway, but if you're not good at quant and the, and the agenda is to just clear the sectional cutoff, 100% or 90%. Whatever you shortlist, you must solve correctly. First work on accuracy, then we work on speed. Coming back, we will then use our mocks to study. Let's say for example, an area like percentages. You thought you were good at percentage and you got a question wrong. Then you see why you got it wrong. Was it a calculation error or was it a conceptual error? If it's a conceptual error, get back to your books, verify it, clean it up and come back. Calculation error, make sure you don't do that because every mark counts in the examination. This is pretty much how anyone rigorously using their mocks can always improve their score in quants and ensure that they can clear the cutoff. Always study the paper and always remember that the question paper dictates attempts. You can never go into a question paper with a pre-set of attempts that I will attempt X number of questions for Y score. That never works. If the question is paper is difficult, four questions will do. If it's an easy, if it's an easy question paper, even 20 might not be enough. Okay. Now we're done with QA. Now we'll move on to other sections. But keep in mind that I will always, always recommend every candidate that they should always utilize their mocks for studies as well as for practice. So moving on to the reasoning section. Reasoning section is one section you should not and cannot be bad at. Right, because reasoning has 60 questions on 200. This is a good chunk of marks. 60 questions on 200 means that you've got to not only clear the cutoff in this section, but you've got to do well in this section. Again, so for reasoning section, I would recommend Number one, cat books. You can use little as cat books, but more than cat books. Because see, cat books have reasoning delayed for cat. You should utilize many of these banking websites. They've got Bankers Adda, they've also got this, and you study smart. So now here's the thing with banking examination in particular. The reasoning questions, because there's so many, there are particular kinds of sets. There are sets for, let's say, we've got your Venn diagram sets, you've got greater than, equal to sets, family relation sets, coding, decoding sets, and stuff like that. There's an entire variety, and then they've got puzzles. Four people sitting in a circle, eight people sitting in an outside a circle, people in a stream, blind, stuff like that. So all of these are sets of questions which you have to practice. Fair bit of advice to everyone, practice and know how to solve every kind of set. You don't have to be good at all the sets, but you should know how to solve every kind of set. And then once you practice enough questions, you will soon develop a proclivity towards something. You will know that, huh, I like to solve this set, or, or I, I am very, very poor at circular puzzles, or I'm very, very bad at, let's say, tower puzzles where you have to organize people in a building and stuff like that. But then you'll always figure out what your strength and weakness is in reasoning. But you should remember that sometimes you could have a very, very easy question from a set you are bad at. So you should always know how to solve it so that you can always hit the easy questions. So understand that practice not only a lot of questions, but also a wide variety of questions to ensure that you can cover every kind of questions that the, that the exam throws at you. And also don't be afraid of surprises. Again, in this, the same way applies. You pick up your study material, you practice. There'll always be level of difficulty, LOD one, two, and three. We're not bothered with three because three will never come up anyway. And even if it does, there's no point solving it in a time-based examination. We start off with one and two. This is found in any basic study material. I cannot keep on telling you that go buy this, buy that. You will understand where to buy the study material from. CAT material, I use, and also ample amount of banking study material offered by lots and lots of coaching, even my analogous coaching. So that is not an issue with. Practice the questions, let's see blood relations. Understand shortcuts. Okay, so now reasoning is an area where shortcuts do work. Where you can pick up some shortcuts because since it's a set-based approach, you can always build some shortcuts for particular questions. Now one very important thing here is learning how to work in an organized manner. Reasoning requires a lot of organization. In the exam hall, you will not be offered a lot of paper and notebook like you have at home where you can keep on solving it. So you've got to be very organized with your building. Let's say for example, there's a puzzle where you've got to arrange people in, in a building. Sometimes you have to make multiple cases. So if you're arranging people in a building, instead of just like making one big area, you could just make this. And you can have case one, case two, case three, and so on and so forth. Arrange, learn how to arrange the parameters very, very well. Case one, case two, case three, and then arrange the parameters. Let's say A is here, and some cases A is here, or stuff like that. 
So learn how to organize your own answers very well. Reasoning may when you organize your answers, that's when you'll not, not only have speed, but cleaner work and you will confuse yourself less. Again, coming back that practice, 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 practice is key. Utilize mocks. Good mocks to use are Anuj's mocks, Olive Board's mocks and practice mocks mocks. Practice mark, Olive Board, Anuj, you can use any of them, but make sure you take all of the mocks. Do not be afraid of mocks. What will happen? Worst case scenario, you will get a zero. It's fine. You can fail in a hundred mocks, but the final question paper you take on that day, that's, that, that should be the one that matters. So do not worry that if you're scoring low in mocks. Understand why you're scoring low in mocks. And then next time, do not score poorly because of that mistake. Make a new mistake and correct that mistake. All right. So in the reasoning paper, we will use the same approach. Whereas once, the, once we take a mock examination, we will start off by visiting all the questions. Right? We will visit all the questions in the first, let's say, reasoning 60 questions, we will allot good 50 to 60 minutes in this section. And then let's say first five to eight minutes, we will spend just reading the questions and then marking the questions we can solve. Because once we know which questions we can solve or which sets we think are easy, because once you read the set, some sets have, let's say five parameters, five people are coming from five different cities with five different shirt colors, with five different gift bags, with five different this, difficult question. But four people sitting in a circle understand that. So we can always identify easier questions. Questions you're good at, let's say blood relations are good at. Confident, you can invest more time in the beginning over there, make sure you get those right. If you're good with, let's say, Venn diagrams or inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, then you could spend some more time there. But this initial reading of the question paper will give you an idea of not only the questions you can solve, but also of the level of difficulty of the section. Like I've said it before, I'll say it again, the level of difficulty will dictate your attempts and you will never go in with a preset. Let's say 2017 RBI cut off for 78. And if you went in with the thing, I will hit 120 questions, you would have failed that paper for sure. RBI 2018, paper was very easy, cut off was close to what, 105. And if you went in with just 120, and then let's say if your accuracy wasn't that great, you would have failed the paper. So we can never have a pre, you know, pre-selection decided attempts like that, that. So first five to eight minutes we read, then we solve the questions we're good at. Make sure we solve in the first round of solving, that is let's say 15 to 20 minutes. We will solve at least, at least 15 to 20 questions. These 15 to 20 questions will ensure that you have cleared the cutoff but, and will give you confidence. In the next 20 minutes, you have to solve a good bit of 20 questions. So total of 40 attempts in 50 minutes should, should do the trick. If not, anywhere between 35 attempts is a reasonable attempt in, in a decent paper. These, so now, reasoning you cannot just get by by claim the cutoff, at least in RBI. Because RBI has sufficient weightage to reasoning. 60 questions is a lot of questions. So make sure you practice, practice a lot and utilize your mocks. Now let's say in the mocks, sometimes we see that, oh, I'm good at this set and we spend a lot of time on it and the easier questions go by. Do not let that happen. I've said this before and emphasize it. Do not take any question that I have to solve it. If it's not working, let it go. Let it go, it's completely fine. As long as you're able to solve the next few questions. Investing too much time on a question is like throwing good money after bad money. We don't do it. In an examination, we have to solve questions, right? So if we can't solve one, we move on and take the next opportunity to solve something. So do not, especially in reasoning. In reasoning, it's very easy to get caught up with particular puzzles and stuff and think that, where am I going wrong? If a puzzle you can't solve in the first or second try, let it go, pick up a different puzzle. Maybe you could solve that with like a, with a fresh pair of eyes. So that's one very important advice. Additionally, like I've said, practice, practice, practice makes, practice is key, practice makes perfect. Keep on practicing, use more mocks. Reasoning, I've already mentioned sources. So very, so the most important thing is variety of sets, variety of questions, lots of practice, right? Moving on. So the next two sessions are, are going to be for your English and GK. English, I'll get down straight to the point that if you're very, very bad at English, where it takes a lot of time for even comprehending English language, understand that English as a language, it will take time. So like, see, unlike reasoning and mathematics, if you spend like a week solving a particular topic, you're almost certain that if a question comes up in the following week, you can solve that topic's question. But English is not the same because English is a language, it takes time to grow. Just like showing once you once you attain that level, 
it's very hard for you to lose it. So English will take time, so do give it the time it requires. Read newspapers, read books, jot down words. And if you're jotting down words for meanings, make sure that you understand how to use the word and not just understand what the word's meaning is. Right? So for English, that's one thing if, it's, if, if, a, partic if a person is very, very bad at it. Additionally, for English, just like how calculation matters for mathematics, in English, reading speed matters. Because if you, re if you read well enough with, with good speed and with comprehension, you can blaze through the sections, score a lot of marks and get out of there. So what successful candidates and what ideally should, one should be trying is that out of 30 questions for English, you should be only giving English 15 minutes maximum, at best 20 minutes if it is your stronger section and you can deviate some time from other sections to this place. In the, in the Again, same strategy follows, you use the first 3 to 4 minutes utilizing which questions you could solve, reading comprehensions, fill in the blanks, word meanings, para jumble, whatever. And after that, you allot which question you want to solve first. If the, if the reading comprehension is very, very long, if there are lengthy RC passages, avoid starting with them. Because the point is, you can always answer an RC when you pick up bits and pieces of it from the thing, from the, from the questions. But spending your initial bit of time to solve easier questions on a lengthy RC will not only induce a sense of panic, but is the wrong strategy to begin with. So first, you then once you've understood that if the RCs are long, you should avoid it. If the RCs are short and small, you can utilize that to take out lots of questions. Or sometimes what RBI does is they'll give one very long RC for 10 questions. If that's the case in this particular examination or the paper you take, then it's, then it's worthwhile investing because spending five minutes reading an RC will give you 10 questions to answer, which is a very good investment. So always pick and choose a strategy that way. Again, there's going to be fill in the blanks. That has a lot to do with vocabulary and your understanding of grammar. But then understand that just studying grammar rules will not help because this is functional English, how English is used and not what the English laws demand. So the only way to bypass this is read a newspaper and read a good newspaper, like, you know, because not only <laughs> does reading a newspaper improve your current affairs, it's giving you an English bonus add on with it. Additionally, let's say sometimes RBI is going, they've been asking idioms and phrases. Let's say a bird in hand is worth two in the bush or a monkey's milk, stuff like that. They ask a lot of idioms and phrases. These are like Hamari Hindi ke muhavre jo hote hain, usi ke basis pe hai. So you can go online, Google, and, there, and there's something, there, there, there's a very good website for this, in fact. There's a website called vocabulary.com. Vocabulary.com is very interactive in the way that not only does the website give you the word meaning, but it uses it in a sentence, and the sentences are quite funny. So this helps you remember it. Additionally, vocabulary.com has its own game stellar to the words you search. Let's say you've searched 25 words and now you want to practice those words for, for the word meanings and sentences. So vocabulary.com not makes like a bunch of flashcards and makes fill in the blanks questions for you to utilize those words. So that's a very good resource to use. Vocabulary.com is sign up for free and they also have a very good scoring system where you can be called Einstein if you do very well. Anyhow. So, so that's one thing, vocabulary, and you're and you, and using idioms and phrases, vocabulary.com also has that. So utilize that for to strengthen your vocabulary and your idioms and phrases and usage of English. Other than that, reading. And finally, coming back to where I always go, mock questions. Take a lot of mocks, utilize the mocks, understand how much time you can give to English and how much you're getting out of it. And then move by quickly. Same strategy, take the mock, understand the questions you've taken, was it worthwhile spending the time, make the decision, if the decision making was wrong, understand that you have to make a better decision next time. If the question was wrong because of a technical problem concept, get back to basics. And that's how we quickly swave by. Now coming to the most important section. So now coming down to the most important section for RBI, the bell of the ball, the, the GA section. So general awareness. As the name suggests, it's what one should be generally aware of. But that's not what RBI thinks it is. A huge bit, 80 questions on 200. 40% of your marks coming from here and the best part is this section does not require any solving does not require any judgment decision making you can solve this section latest by 10 minutes and if you're quick 7 to 8 minutes that's what good candidates usually take if you're slow maybe 12 minutes but do not spend more time than 12 minutes on this section because you can save a bunch of time from here and give it to all the other sections to clear the paper and over here, one would suggest a good score should be 50 plus. 50 plus is a good score. And if you can, and if you have problems with other sections, you should maximize the score over here so that you can compensate for other sections. So GK, most important thing is having multiple sources for GK, but 
centering yourself to one particular source. When I started my preparation, I used the magazine launched by Anuj. It was Spotlight because Anuj gives it for both for phase one and for phase two. So Spotlight was my primary source. I, I used it. I read it. And on top of that, to cope up with the, let's say, other materials and for another secondary reference so I could have a variety of information, I used Bankers Adda's Hindu monthly review. Bankers Adda on the next month, let's say for example it's February, on the 4th of March or 5th of March, they launch a Hindu monthly review. Whereas they review in one lines or two lines at best, whatever has happened in the month gone by in the newspaper, the Hindu, which is like the competitive exam newspaper, which all candidates do read. So, so that's one very, very, very important source. On top of this, if you want to practice multiple type of questions, you can go to GK today. They have a daily GK quiz and they have an archive where you can go back and take all the previous quizzes as well. So that's very helpful. GK today, FIS cloud, whatever the source may be, the important thing is that you have one primary source which you know through and through very, very well. And a secondary source which you can refer to if you feel like, but a primary source will do you well. So understand that. Again, once you've covered it, most people ask, the month or the time frame for GK. So since RBI doesn't have like a fixed date like CAT does or let's say UPSC does where they are in particular months, it's very difficult to tell how many months does one go by. But let's say if the exam is going to be in August, you should start off with anywhere between December and January for, for the previous year all the way up to August. Do not take for granted that if the exam is on 15th August or 16th August that you could stop reading GK from that. Keep on reading GK because you never know what contemporary issue or what issue you may read that particular day from previous date might come that way. So GK is one thing which I recommend you should study till the last minute till you go into the examination hall because that will help you. Anything else I usually point out students that why are you studying outside the examination hall personally I've never done that but GK is one thing you can certainly bank all your time on because this is the place where although preparation is a grind where you have to study a lot and cover a lot and initially it seems like a lot but once done, the returns are massive, especially in this paper, because this GK will not only help you in phase one, but phase two and also in the interview rounds of the RBI examination. So GK has to be focused on. So remember that you will have to take from one particular primary source. It should be a good source, which you're confident with. And then if you feel like it, you can have a secondary source and go by. I understand the nature of GK in phase one. It's slightly different from phase two. We'll talk about it in phase two. Nature of GK in phase one is very one-liner or very banker style because the bank examinations have been asking those kind of GK first. So let's say if somebody goes to a particular country or we have a, some particular deal with that country, we will not only have the, let's say which ministry had that deal, but also they could ask you a particular capital of that country visited by our prime minister and stuff like that. So it's very, very, very a mix of current GK, but also static GK. So have that. I would not recommend spending too much time memorizing national parks and memorizing stuff like that. Simply because even if it does come up, it's at best five marks. So spending five marks for something that you might forget in examination is not worth it. Whereas you could spend the hours instead of memorizing parks, studying more current affairs and general affairs. So that will help you out. RBI is very economic based or very banking or finance based. So do go to the RBI website because the general awareness session is not just current affairs based. It is also based on some background knowledge. Like they could ask you what is the full form of NEFT or what are the timings for NEFT or, or how many batches are there for NEFT and stuff like that. That is there on the RBI's website or a basic banking awareness agenda. Bankers Adda has banking awareness. Anuj Spotlight has a good banking awareness section on it that. So we can go for it that way. Understand so it's current affairs, banking affairs, economic affairs. They ask questions like what is the TIL's prediction for growth this year? So understand it's just more than current affairs. There's going to be some bit of banking knowledge, some bit of economics and some bit of current affairs. All of this done together will give you a good score of 50, 50, 50 plus. With this, we're done with phase one. So let's, let's review. Most important thing, if you're weak at quants is to practice. Remember practicing 50 questions for a particular topic will help you gain mastery over it. Then after practicing, we go towards time test taking. After test taking, we go towards proper mocks. Mocks has been a sure shot success way strategy for me because I utilize mocks and a lot of the successful candidates do that. So mocks is a very good way of not only reviewing your preparation and assessing where you lie, but also covering the entire syllabus in one fell swoop. So understand, use, use the mocks to the best of your abilities. They're there for it. Practice mock, olive board, anu jindal. You can use any of these you like or all three if you like. They're not very expensive, thankfully for RBI. So that's one way to go about it. Remember, each section has a different demand, a different thing. 
if you're good all of them well and good if you're poor somewhere recognize it work on it try and rectify it if you cannot rectify it by the time of examination do not worry make sure you clear the sectional cut off and then score elsewhere so review it yourself you know yourself better than anybody else know where you're strong know where you're weak and plan it that way this strategy is for everybody but personalize it to your needs and tones thank you so moving on to phase two like it just starts off with one big advice is ga ga and a lot more ga so we'll be covering phase two in all aspects we've got the three papers uh, esi economics and social affairs the english paper and we've got finance and management so starting off straight away with esi ESI is the paper that Anuj likes to define as 70-30 and sometimes it could even be 80-20 whereas 70% is from the general awareness section and 30% is static so if you're, if you're somebody who does not know anything about the anything about the economy or if you've never studied economics before don't even know what the basic definitions are this paper could be slightly challenging but then the right strategy and the right sources and good bit of dedication will help you get through so for somebody who's never done anything economics related mostly engineering graduates or somebody who's trying to switch fields altogether so the starting point for for anyone that would be do not use those major recommended books like Ramesh Chandra or Uma Kapila simply because these are very very sort of course books which require some prior knowledge of economics. What you can do is you can utilize books like the NCRT. However, the NCRT itself will throw around some terms which you are not familiar with. So I would recommend use Google for those terms and understand what those terms are. There are many sources from Google or YouTube. Like Anuj himself uh, teaches economics definitions. There's Khan Academy, there is Murnal and stuff like that. But not everybody has access to Murnal. If you are comfortable with Hindi, you can use Murnal's free research, which he has added on his website and quickly get through the economics, right? So economic static portion, it's, it's, it's going to be heavy bit on yourself because if you are not subscribing to any particular coaching and have no experience with economics, you will have to sort of disintegrate your preparation and pick up your definition and knowledge as per the syllabus from multiple sources to understand for yourself. A coaching gives you the benefit that they do all this work for you and present it to you, all right? Now moving on to what I said as I started off, GK, 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 GA, everything. Since it's economics and social affairs, it's what our country is going through. So study number one, like always have, since it's again GA based, you must always have a primary source and then it, it benefits to have more sources, but always have a primary source. My primary source was Vision IS, monthly current affairs PDFs. And since I subscribed to Anuj's coaching, Anuj gave out a lot of material for phase two GA in his magazine and also otherwise that helped me strengthen up my concept for the thing. Since it's a social affairs, economics affairs paper, not only current affairs, but also things that are of the past, but are now institutions or bodies in their own right. Let's say the insolvency and bankruptcy code, they have their own thing. So back in 2016, that was a current affairs topic. But now since it's a body in its own right, it's got its own structure and like a chair and stuff like that. You have to not only study what the body does and what it is and how it came into being, but also what current affairs are doing, like which companies are they dealing with or which companies are they selling off or the stake is being sold in which banks and work. So it goes that way. So I use Vision IS, I know gentle stuff. And sometimes if I had more time, and I was done reading for that particular month from these two sources, I would go to Insights on India. One good help to candidates would be if they want to cover the economic happenings, like, like the bodies that are formed or like the policies the government of India made, they could use Insights on India's one year review, like the economic yearly review. So they review everything done in like the past 12 months, Eco economy wise, but not current affairs, but like what particular policies, like the special economic zone policy or like the export policy of India, stuff like that. So they do cover that, which is very, very helpful. But this is very advanced study. This is towards the later half. The initial bit must be stick to your primary source. Make sure you study current affairs well. And there has to be some depth to your current affairs. You can't just study something and then leave it. RBI, since it's an objective type paper, it is going to be very, very factual in nature. So memorizing facts is key. Now, when it comes to facts, there are two very, very good sources that you can refer to. Okay, so for the previous years, because the, the economic survey and budget were a very, very helpful source. This year is the Niti Aayog's report. Niti Aayog has come out with three to four documents which you can refer to. And this is very important because this is what the gov this is the government's opinion. This is the government's 
what the government to give the economy and what they're willing to do in the future. There's like a vision document and stuff like that. So that is very important to refer to. Their target rates, what kind of growth they want to achieve, what economy does India want to become. These are very important terms which you must pick up from these places. Being factual means that you don't have to read the actual World Bank Development Report or the UNO report or the IMF report. But you have to pick up the major facts that they throw out. Let's say most of these usually they predict India's GDP percentage, let's say 7.6. Or most of these predict India's rank in a particular thing or India's WPI or India's inflation or India's future growth that India would be a 10 trillion dollar economy by which year. So all of these are facts which you must memorize. Additionally, since it's economics affairs, things like, links, things like the world business, do, doing business report, India has been constantly improving in those ranks, they come into play. Other reports like the ecology and environment report or energy index and stuff like that also come into play because this bit, the ecology, environment, sustainability, all of this comes into the social affairs portion. So when you move that, so you have to understand that what you must cover. So, and one bit of advice, you, you don't have to go through Vision IS's entire document. They have an uh, index. In the index, they have economic affairs, go through those, and social affairs, go through those. Social affairs, may, instead of me telling you everything, what you must do is go to the RBI's website and the RBI grade B, download the syllabus. The entire syllabus is there with you, memorize it, utilize it, and then put the syllabus in Google News and search for it. Google News gives you the, the, gives you the benefit of finding current affairs to the entire topic. And this solves your entire problem that where do I find the current affairs for the particular topic and where do I study the particular topic from. This is all if you're self-sufficient. Otherwise, you can always have people who, who do this work for you and that's why we go to coachings. Now, so learn to balance that ESI current affairs is heavy. If you're a note maker, you can make notes. If you're not a note maker, you can just print the copies out or mark them on your PDF using a PDF writer and that. Do whatever you're comfortable with. That is the most important strategy I would give. And always differentiate between studying and revising. When you're out there in the initial months studying, by studying I mean you have completed your static portion, you're moving towards studying the GA portion, that you want to cover as much ground as possible. So let's say if you're referring to two sources and you've already studied GST mechanism in your primary source, you need not study it again in your secondary source. Skip it and find more material. Because that's the point of studying, you are covering more ground. When it comes to revision, that is when you would get back to your basics and start reading stuff over and again so that it's, it's in your memory, all right? This is the key way to study for ESI. And remember, ESI, one can always, I mean, even I wasn't, and most candidates are never certain of scoring a lot. So you've got to cover as much as you can to the best of your abilities, and then take mock examinations. I will come back to, I'll be coming back to mocks again, because over here, I utilize mocks in a very special way. So for this year's RBI, grade B 2018, I took mock series again from Olive Board and Practice Mock, and I did have Anuj's mocks. What I did was, instead of studying a lot and then taking a mock, I just opened the mock and got a big zero on it. Since I got a huge big zero, I knew I could take any question on now and see if I knew it. I would then re-attempt the paper with whatever question. I would solve the, I would hit the answer to the question and then realize, okay, if the answer was correct, it would give me confidence and I'd be like, okay, I know this area well, or I know the scheme well, or I know the current affairs well enough. If the answer was wrong, I would see why it was wrong. If it was wrong because I forgot something, I would, I would revisit it in the answer column and then in my notes. If it was because I had no heads or tails, no idea about it, then that was an issue. Because if I didn't know something, I would then, obviously now, since I've read the question, I have more information because now I, now I have an idea about it and then I can study it. And if, if I made a mistake, I would correct my mistake. So this is a two-way process. So in this, using this, in one and a half hours, one hour, 30 minutes, I would not just take a mock, but I would study, revise, and take a mock at the same time. And I think that's a very good strategy to work backwards with your mock. Because when you're starting, you can, you can only study one area. You could do economics, you could do social affairs, but in a mock, you can do everything, the static and the current. So, so this really helps. I took 20 mocks, each has 65 questions. That is what? 1300 questions, that's a good, good bit of questions to practice. And out of these 1300, even if 10 to 15 questions for one or two mark come in your final paper, you're pretty strong in the scoring area. So, moving on. This is the opposite 70-30. We have the finance and management paper, FM paper. 
since I put 70, 70 here, I'll put 30 here and 70 here this time. Now in this case, it's the complete flip. We have 70% from the static portion and 30% or even fewer, let's say 20% from the current affairs portion in the finance and management paper because RBI syllabus is very specific and more recently RBI has moved towards their syllabus. You can download the syllabus from the not not notification comes out or from the previous notification and RBI has stuck to the syllabus. This year there were no numericals in the finance and management paper and that's why the scores were pushed up. So there is no certainty that next year there'll be the same paper but however we have noticed the pattern that RBI is moving towards the assigned syllabus. So for this the static portion I personally use the course uh, the coursework I had bought from Anuj because I do not have the time to cover books but if people are inclined to refer to books but with zero knowledge then they would have to supplement their knowledge with other sources like Google, YouTube and stuff like that. So for, EA, so for finance and management a very quick thing would be get the syllabus start googling your way through there are multiple sources you can refer to there are finance books there are online sources there are YouTube channels take your pick and go after it but the important criteria here is to stick to the syllabus what RBI has given to you so that you know exactly what they're demanding. There's no point in studying high level modeling or high level financial techniques which are not required by the RBI. Most courses would give you a bunch of stuff which you don't even require. There is the thing that you have to go through that. Also, an, an extra treasure trove for the RBI is going to be the RBI website itself. The RBI website at the bottom of the page has the FAQs. Just scroll down and type FAQs and whatever you're seeking from the Indian financial system, you will, you will understand. Because the RBI gives you a huge bunch of questions and answers. Anything regarding NBFCs, regarding private sector lending, regarding banking norms, regarding the Indian economy. In fact, RBI gives his entire mandate. If, if you could go to the RBI website towards the right of the screen, what the RBI does, it's the, management, it's the manager of the Indian currency. It is also the policy maker. So if you click on that, there's the entire overview of what the RBI does and what committees are involved in. So the RBI website is a very, very good source to study from. But also at the same time, don't overdo it because the RBI website is loaded with information for, about the Indian system. Some of it is useful, some of it is not useful. So pick and choose your battles every time you open the RBI website. Make sure you're sticking with the syllabus because the syllabus is very specific and that is what they demand of you. Now, as far as the current affairs, the, the same sources for ESI that I've mentioned are the sources for the current affairs. Additionally, you can cover the budget in some depth because the finance and management does ask questions as to what are the allotments and what is that. Also terminologies. What is the revenue deficit? What is the GDP deficit? What is the fiscal deficit? All of these terminologies are asked, budgetary terminologies, what is a bond, what is a zero coupon bond. These are all financial terminologies which you will find. If you want to refer to books, M.Y. Khan, I suppose that that is a very, very good book that people refer to. There is also another book which RBI itself gives it in the direction. But then again, remember that the examination will happen in a span of four months. Covering an entire book in four months is very difficult. So you have to pick your strategy that even if you are buying a book, selectively choose the chapters from within the book and also from the chapter selectively study what is required. There's no point in studying an entire chapter on bond valuation with complex techniques when RBI just wants simple bonds with linear problems because RBI does not allow calculate. At least up till these, these past two years, 17 and 18, there was no calculator allowed in the examination. Hence, they cannot ask you very complicated questions for, for calculations. Also, people who are worried about numericals because most students are worried about numericals. Numericals are important and you must have a variety of them to practice, but don't get your head too stuck in them because out of 65 questions, even if let's say five are numericals, then you can safely avoid them if you are very strong with other concepts. But simply buying more books to practice numericals or just only bending your health hand around numericals, which given how there's almost a lot of variation in rounding off in the finance uh, techniques, there could be problems in the final answer. Hence, don't be tormented by numericals. At the same time, don't give them up because they are easy to solve and they are doable. So for numericals, mocks would be very good. Utilize your mocks very, very well. I think there's no way people would skip mocks, especially in the finance and management section because the static part is very, very helpful. Very helpful when it comes to mock practice. I mean, half the stuff you will revise your management portion, your finance portion from the mocks itself. Coming to management. 
Now management on its own, some people think it's very difficult, some think it's very easy. But it's neither easy nor difficult. It is a mix of traditional management theory which everybody has to study, which is there in every book. And also since RBI itself is a dynamic body and it's a dynamic paper to recruit people who are up with the current times, there will be certain theories and there will be questions which are based on fairly recent or fairly modern management theories, which candidates should be aware of. If you are subscribed to a good business journal like the Hindu Business Line or the Howard Business Review, for example, because these are more academic journals, then you could have an update on that. If not, it would be better that if you Google those topics. Again, if you go to Google and you type that topic, let's say motivation theory. So once you type the motivation theory, you will always get those classic theories from Abraham Maslow to Frederick Herzberg, but also some newer theories. Or if you type organizational behavior and stuff like that, then you would find some more. You don't have to be overly in, like, you know, involved with those theories, but at the same time, you must have a basic idea about them. So in case a question comes up, you are able to answer. Finance and management, a good source would also be previous papers. Because this paper is so static heavy, you can sort of utilize the previous papers to build the areas from which questions come about. I see a lot of people and in institutions dividing marks as to which area does the marks come from and that could be helpful that not, but at the end of the day you have to study everything to score a lot more so understand that fm is very syllabus driven very very source driven if you are using books make sure you use them smartly and selectively make your notes well enough if you're not a note maker make sure you underline and highlight the points which is important and also i would recommend that once you're studying something study with depth and conviction that you get it in the first you should not spend during a revision, you should not spend a lot of time going back to the stuff you've already done so that revision is actually serving its purpose of revision and not studying all over again. You should be revising via mocks, you should be revising with quick reading and that's it. Studying should be done in the initial rounds. And also as for the timeline, I would recommend candidates to start with finance and management because since it's so static heavy, you can cover it quickly and, and, and you can cover it in hand. Whereas the 20% for the current affairs of this plus the huge 70% of current affairs for the ESI portion can be covered all the way towards the last day. One good area that will give you marks in both finance and management and ESI is the government of India schemes. There are huge binders out there. Anuj hands out one. There is the binder from uh, Insights on India and also Vision IS. That is a huge compilation of all the government of India schemes ministry wise. Please study all those schemes because Government of India schemes is a very major area for question asking. Because the Government of India runs so many financial schemes, economic schemes, social schemes, that a question from them is 100% assured. Just the, just the areas which scheme would come, but a question is mostly certain to come. So it's 120 pages mostly. If you cover them all, or if you cover a good portion of it, there, there's a good chance you will score well in those areas. So government schemes is a good area to get marks from. Marks plus, it's always in current affairs. You name any scheme right now. Like, that, that's how it comes about. So government schemes, current affairs sources, and in FM static portion, that is how you will cover it. So the last section, which is always the most neglected section. So last, but not the least, and also very, very important, that makes a huge factor whether you'll make it or not in the RBI grade B examination, is the English section. So this section is pretty straightforward. There's one essay, there's one pressy writing, and lastly, a reading comprehension. However, the scoring process is <laughs> very known to RBI, not known to candidates, because I didn't score very, very well. So I'll just give you general tips which candidates must follow and they should understand. Okay, so number one, since it's a descriptive examination, you have to type your answers on the keyboard. Your typing speed has to be up there. So you have one and a half hours in which you have to frame an essay, you have to frame a pressy, and also, answer for reading comprehension. So for that, you need to have good typing speed to execute whatever you have framed. Number two, the which is very neglect is that, see, your current affair preparation is more than sufficient for fodder for your essay. You must learn to put in an essay format, so understand how to write an essay, just Google it, or if you know it from back English days, that's fine as well. Also, do actually type out or write essays. Do do that, because it is once you get into writing, if you're not very comfortable writing that, you can actually jot out essays and put out essays and points. If you want like topics to write essays, there are many topics. Like all these institutes put out 50 most demanding essays or like 50 expected questions for an essay. You can do that, pick in 10 topics, start answering questions on those and write the essays. 
word of advice stick to the word limit for the rbi if you have to have to breach it by not more than 10 percent but try not to breach it also for english make sure there are no spelling mistakes no grammar no grammatical error proper organization of thought flow so it must have an intro body and conclusion for pressy writing a pressy always has to be one third of the original so if there are 450 words your pressy has to be a 150 words so make sure you are not repeating unnecessary information and you're maintaining the same flow that is given in the original paragraph right lastly for the reading comprehension some people recommend answer writing answers in bullet points some people recommend writing answers in paragraph formats you could choose either one as long as you're comfortable with it so for the English thing, understand that the most crucial aspect is number one, your knowledge of whatever they're asking you, what are the questions is, and lastly, your writing ability, which comes from practice. So please always ensure that you are practicing your writing ability and also typing speed so that when the day comes, you are able to type it well. All right. Thank you very, very much. That is all that I have for my RBI grade B examination approach and my journey. And I, I, I hope I have been able to help a lot of you out there, if there are any questions, leave them in the comment section below. We will try and get back to you as soon as we possibly can. Thank you very much.